Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Eric Hauge, Executive Director of Homeline, and you've joined us today, Thursday, May 14th at 1.30 for our fourth uh, weekly tenant landlord uh, law during the COVID-19 pandemic webinar. Um, Homeline's Managing Attorney Mike Bra will be uh, doing today's webinar and um, a little overview of some of the t key issues and then uh, we'll have time for questions after. Some folks did submit questions in advance, so we'll get to those first, uh, but you are welcome to submit questions throughout the webinar uh, via the Q&A question and answer system and we'll get to them uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, just a reminder, Homeline, we're a statewide nonprofit organization. We provide free legal advice for renters uh, and we've advised over a quarter million renters since opening. Um, our main program is that hotline, uh, available in four languages, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong. Uh, that's our tenant hotline number. We can only advise renters uh, and uh, renters with advocates, um, but we provide this webinar and other trainings for landlords as a public service. Um, and a reminder, we are doing these on a regular weekly basis. Wednesdays at 1.30, we do a webinar with an audience in mind of tenants and advocates, service providers. And uh, today, every Thursday at 1.30, uh, a webinar designed more for landlords and property managers. Next week, we are doing a all Spanish language webinar on Tuesday afternoon, designed more for tenants and service providers. All the registration links are on our website. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Homelines Managing Attorney, Mike Bra to kick us off. Thanks, Eric. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you for those of you that have uh, watched in past weeks. Uh, today is, as promised, uh, a day of some new news. Uh, the governor yesterday made several new executive orders. Uh, Certainly the most impactful in the landlord tenant arena is the extension or renewal of the peacetime emergency, which was originally declared in mid-March, then renewed in uh, mid-April, and was once again renewed yesterday. Uh, the reason why that's so important for landlord tenant law is because the moratorium or uh, effective ban on evictions is tied to the peacetime emergency, at least as far as the calendar is concerned. Uh, that's the, the time frame that evictions, the eviction moratorium covered, again, in Executive Order 20-14. I don't like to, to quote a lot of laws when we're doing these webinars because I know that there's a real different uh, level of uh, people that care about you know, what the statutory site might be for something or something like that. But this is the most important thing I think that I can point to right now uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic when it comes to the landlord-tenant issue is that executive order which bans evictions, uh, except for a, just a, a few exceptions. We have the uh, the drugs, illegal drugs, illegal weapons, prostitution and contraband rule that remains in effect. And that is one way that a landlord could file an eviction right now. The only other exception is if the tenant is endangering the safety of others, whether they're in the building or the, I suppose the landlord in theory. Uh, but that's the only exception to that. So uh, the traditional reasons that landlords could file evictions, a uh, tenant has a dog when they're not supposed to, they have an unauthorized occupant they, uh, the tenant hasn't paid rent, which is, accounts for well over 90% of evictions in Minnesota. Uh, a landlord still cannot file evictions for those reasons. That moratorium or effective ban on evictions uh, from the state level runs at this point through June 12th uh, next month. Uh, June 12th is a Friday. So effectively, uh, it's pretty difficult to file. You can't file a case that day. Uh, at least it wouldn't be schedulable um, and probably wouldn't happen until that Monday where anybody would schedule it. So I think June 29th would be the most likely first day an eviction would be heard if uh, the governor does not extend the moratorium or if the legislature doesn't extend the moratorium, they also have the power to extend 
the moratorium uh, on evictions. That is the state level consideration, and that is the big change uh, today that was announced last night by the governor. The federal law has not changed on when evictions can be filed. That is found in something called the CARES Act, uh, which uh, was a sweeping uh, piece of legislation, did not talk about just landlords and tenants, uh, but it does mention evictions. And the CARES Act uh, stops landlords from being able to file evictions through July 25th uh, of 2020. Uh, and it also requires that landlords must give a 30-day notice at that point if the uh, tenant hasn't paid the rent. Now, the CARES Act only applies to non-payment of rent cases. So that, that dog, when the lease doesn't allow dogs, or the unauthorized occupant that we mentioned earlier, uh, would be fair game under the CARES Act. But a non-payment of rent case, which again, is almost every eviction in Minnesota, uh, would not be fileable if the CARES Act is in play. So that is a real question, where does the CARES Act apply? So the easy answers to the CARES Act questions are uh, if there's a federal subsidy involved in some way, and I'm, I'm sort of oversimplifying what the CARES Act says about that, but that's how it works. If there's a federal subsidy at all, so if the entire building is subsidized, um, if it's project-based Section 8, if it's public housing, uh, all kinds of subsidies around the state that are applied to uh, rental housing, if it's federally based, then the CARES Act applies. The harder question, this is the really difficult question, is if there is a mortgage that is federally backed, so if you have a landlord in Minneapolis who owns a duplex and they live on one side and the tenant lives on the other, uh, does the CARES Act kick in? And the short answer is it might. Uh, it might kick in. Um, this, so if, if the landlord's uh, mortgage is secured by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, then yes, uh, the CARES Act applies. So how would somebody know if the CARES Act applies? How would a tenant know, first of all, if they're trying to defend an eviction saying, hey, the CARES Act should apply here? Uh, that is almost impossible for the tenant to figure out. The mortgage company knows, certainly, and their customer, the landlord, can ask the mortgage provider, hey, I, I'm one of your customers and I need to know some details about the mortgage because the landlord might very innocently not have any idea if Freddie may I'm sorry, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac uh, are involved in their mortgage. They just know they got their mortgage at the bank down the street. So they'll probably have to do some sleuthing on their own because they're the customer of record and so they can actually get access to that information. Uh, so anyhow, our best guess uh, is 20, maybe as high as 50% of rentals in Minnesota would be covered by the CARES Act. We really don't know yet because honestly nobody's ever really needed to ask that question before now when it came to eviction hearings. Um, in, in our mind, the, the cleanest way to do all of this would be somehow if the governor uh, decided or maybe the legislature to uh, parallel the CARES Act and then that question would become moot. But as it stands right now, uh, everybody's preparing for the eviction moratorium to be lifted uh, June 12th, because we can't do anything else. The courts can't do anything else. They have to be prepared to go. Landlords are, you know, uh, in some cases, hoping that they'll be able to file that eviction on, on June 13th, which means the 15th. Um, tenants are wondering if this is going to be something where the landlord could file the eviction at that point. Uh, and so that is the status of the big change from, from yesterday. Uh, and I'll just talk another couple minutes, and then we're going to start with the questions. Uh, mentioning some of the issues that we've seen rise repeatedly um, on our tenant hotline where we take about 15,000 calls a year from renters all around the state. As you can imagine, in the last six, seven weeks, uh, a massive percentage of our calls have had a COVID-19 element to them because that's just seeped into every part of our lives. So the two areas where we have seen a uh, marked increase in calls are in uh, privacy, so the landlord using their key to enter a rental unit, which has become a very contentious issue. Uh, understandably so, I think. Uh, tenants are nervous about having anybody in their home. Landlords uh, have forever been able to access rental units for a variety of business purposes. Uh, the one that seems to be uh, most contentious is showings, and we are, of course, in the showing season. Most landlord and tenant agreements in Minnesota end uh, if they have a, a terminal date, so a one-year lease, when is it going to end? They almost always end in the summer. Landlords and tenants both prefer to have leases start and end in the summer for obvious reasons. Nobody wants to move 
on January 31st or February 1st. Everybody thinks it's nice to move on May 31st or June 30th. Um, so if a tenant is given a notice to vacate, which is allowed, uh, a tenant can move out right now. Um, if a tenant is given a notice to vacate for the end of June, for instance, or the end of July right now, the landlord may want to start showing the rental unit. In past years, the landlord would say, tenant, you know what, somebody's coming over tomorrow at 10 in the morning uh, to see your place, and I hope you can make it presentable. Something like that. The tenant would know, the current tenant would know that somebody's coming by. Uh, with COVID-19, none of the laws changed, but the law is, is being dissected a bit more. We actually created a position paper on this, which is something we haven't done a lot in the past before, um, on just this issue for just this moment in time, uh, privacy, when can the landlord enter during the COVID-19 era? And I know that Eric just put it up in our chat box and he'll be posting things that I've mentioned uh, throughout the day so you can find them easily. Uh, so the, the part of the privacy statute that says when a landlord can come in mentions two things. It mentions that the landlord has to have a reasonable business purpose for entering and also has to give re reasonable notice. But the statute also has a phrase in it that hasn't meant much before now. Uh, the, the law has been around for uh, almost 30 years now, well, 25 years. Uh, and it, it's got this, this phrase in it, though, that says, under the circumstances. And so the circumstances now are we've got a uh, you know, terribly infectious disease, which is dangerous for people. And so what if we have a tenant that has a heightened, you know, uh, a com compromised immuno compromised system, uh, or they've got an elderly parent staying with them, or maybe they're elderly, or they've got a sick kid, and they really don't want anybody in their home. And so we tried to answer this question as much as we could and talk about what tenants and landlords are sort of coming up with as solutions right now. The, the first one that we mentioned is the virtual showing approach, which uh, a lot of landlords do already anyway, uh, as do people trying to sell a house. Uh, but if the landlord wants a, a modern, up-to-the-minute picture of what the place looks like, we, we tell the current tenant, hey, look, talk to the landlord and see if they'll be okay with you taking a bunch of photos or maybe even a video to show the place so they can show it to somebody else. We've heard from tenants that are shopping right now that uh, landlords are rarely letting them in to see rental units as well, which is normally, under normal circumstances, something I would never encourage a prospective tenant to do. Uh, I always like the notion of seeing the, the place in advance, but right now, I, I'm just not sure that that's the most sensible approach for anybody to take. If a showing is to take place, I think that the landlord owes it to the current tenant and to the uh, prospective tenant and to themselves, honestly, that they try to do as much as they can to minimize the chance of exposure. So there's ways to do that. Uh, if there's going to be a showing, the current tenant should leave all the lights on, so no light switches have to be touched. Uh, they open all the, the doors, the closet doors, the bathroom doors, so no doors need to be touched. Minimize the contact points. This is the kind of thing that realtors are doing right now as well. And ideally, the landlord and the uh, prospective tenant would be wearing masks and gloves when they come in, uh, just out of respect for the person that lives there currently. Uh, anyhow, that's something we've tried to answer repeatedly. Uh, the last two points I'll bring up before we get to the questions are uh, the governor's order did have another impact as well. The eviction moratorium also bans landlords from terminating tenancies. Uh, and so any landlord that had given a notice for the tenant to vacate by the end of May, um, so maybe that was given in late April or even in late March, depending on how much notice was required in the lease, uh, if a landlord is given a notice for the end of May, there's not really any good way to enforce that on June 1st for the landlord. They couldn't file an eviction uh, under the current orders on June 1st for what we would call holding over. That's another reason. There's only a few different reasons you can file an eviction, and that's one of the reasons for holding over. The landlord couldn't file that for the end of May. Uh, so any non-renewals or notices to vacate that a landlord is given for then, an eviction's not really filable. Well, it's filable, but it's not gonna be scheduled um, until uh, at least June 15th, like I said, probably uh, earlier. Uh, the last thing I'm going to bring up is a new topic, I think, for these webinars, which uh, we've done one each week for landlords and one each week for social workers and tenants, but it's something that I've uh, been hearing more and more from tenants and staff that are talking to other tenants as well, and that's the amenities question. Uh, which is landlords, when they are selling rental units, advertise what it comes with. Uh, 
right? You get a two bedroom with two, a bathroom, in, in unit, washer and dryer, whatever it might be. But it also might have other things included, uh, like a uh, workout room or a swimming pool or a dog track or whatever. You can imagine all the amenities that landlords sell. Again, this isn't hard to imagine right now. Landlords are saying, sorry, those are closed. And they've been saying that since mid-March. But tenants say, well, wait a second, I'm paying full rent and you're not giving me everything I, I've paid for. And we're, we're working on putting a, a position paper on, on that together as well uh, to try to talk about sort of the nuances of that issue. We do know that there are many landlords that have actually uh, reduced rent. And this is what they use to justify the reduction in rent um, is they'll say, you know what, you, you're not getting all the amenities that you've been promised over the years or through your lease. And so we'll knock down your rent. Uh, and it's, it's honestly typically a nominal amount, but it's one of those things that can make a customer feel like they're uh, treated fairly, I guess, in this situation. Just like where we see uh, car insurance companies now refunding uh, money for car insurance because people simply aren't driving. Um, and I'm not sure if that was done because of some sort of legislative edict or executive order or not, or if they just decided to do it on their own. But like I said, we have seen some landlords do this voluntarily, and we're getting more and more questions about that kind of thing from tenants as the... Uh, pandemic uh, continues on. But having said all that, uh, I'd be happy to open it up to, to start with the questions that were submitted in advance, and then we'll get to the ones that we've gotten uh, today. I imagine that we can take all of those and then some, knowing sort of the volume of, of uh, call or questions that we have so far. But Eric, if you want to start with our first um, one in advance. Yep. Uh, so the first one, how does the eviction moratorium impact the ability to purchase a duplex as a primary residence uh, with FHA loan uh, and, and the residence is currently occupied. Um, so this is a little bit hard for me to answer. First of all, I don't work with landlords trying to get mortgages, so I don't know the process that one has to go through. So if the question is, how do we get over the mortgage hurdle? Uh, I'm not sure that I can answer that. If the question is, how do we remove a tenant that is currently there? Um, in, in the duplex, let's say it's a new owner and they want to take over the whole duplex and uh, maybe live in one half. And so they want to remove a tenant that is currently there. The first thing that I would say, and this is not a COVID-19 answer, this is just kind of what landlords run into when they buy a property, is that they probably have to honor the terms of the old lease. So if that tenant's lease goes through uh, September, uh, even no COVID-19 rules in place, the landlord couldn't just remove that tenant. They'd have to wait until September. I mean, the, the landlord can try to buy the tenant out, and that actually happens quite a bit, where the landlord will offer what typically is referred to as cash for keys. But uh, does the landlord have the right to simply remove the tenant because it's, it's a new owner? No. The, the phrase that we lawyers typically use when it comes to the change in ownership uh, is that the new owner steps into the shoes of the old owner. And that's how it works with almost all leases. So the, the new owner has to honor the terms of the old lease is the typical rule. If, if the, the lease is up or it's a month to month lease and the landlord is saying, I wanna get that tenant out of there right now, then uh, the COVID-19 question does come into play. First of all, if they'd given a notice for the end of May, that notice is suddenly, well, it's, it's difficult legally to figure out what it means exactly. Because the governor's order arguably means that any notice given during the COVID-19 pandemic, during the peacetime emergency, is uh, not valid, that a landlord can't terminate a tenancy. The, the, one of the biggest unanswered questions from our landlord-tenant law camp right now is what happens to a notice to vacate that's given projecting into the future past when the peacetime emergency is gone. So if a landlord today gives a notice for the end of June and Governor Waltz does not uh, extend the peacetime emergency uh, from June 12th on, would that notice to vacate be valid? And at present, the only game in town really for enforcing these kinds of things is the Attorney General's office. And uh, they have, to my knowledge, not taken one of those cases yet. They're tasked with enforcing these rules. Um, they have filed court cases against landlords that have violated the no eviction rule and there's been some lockouts or ousters and utility shutoffs and things like that. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that the attorney general would go after a landlord that gave a notice 
um, for a future date. But if a landlord tries to enforce one, again, for May 31st, and the tenant doesn't vacate by June 1, then uh, I, I think the Attorney General's office would absolutely get involved in those kinds of cases from what we've heard from them. Next question. Do not, uh, non-renewal letters sent in March, are they still in effect during the peacetime order? Yeah, so this is what we've been talking about. And if one was sent in March, I would assume it's effective for the end of May because there's a lot of 60-day notices, especially uh, one-year leases and suburban leases, if I'm generalizing, those are the most common types of terms that we see uh, is a 60-day notice requirement. But that notice is now uh, in serious legal jeopardy. I guess if a landlord really wants to try to use that non-renewal and make it effective, um, they shouldn't accept rent in June. That would be my advice. Because in theory, they'd be waiving the right to evict for holding over if they accepted rent for a month subsequent to when the tenant was supposed to go. So if a landlord really wants somebody gone um, and they gave a notice for the end of May, I guess they shouldn't accept the rent, but again, I think that's risky. I think that the notice that they gave might have violated the uh, governor's order to begin with. Trying to enforce it now might violate the governor's order. Um, and so probably what's left if the landlord and the tenant don't come up with a brand new lease is that the tenant becomes a, a holdover tenant and it rolls over into typically a month to month lease with all the original lease terms involved. So. A landlord, if they really want to non-renew somebody, could wait until the peacetime emergency is finally ended and then give a new notice uh, at that point for, you know, whatever the 60-day notice requirement in their lease might be or a full month notice requirement. Next question. Son of deceased parents home in probate without a lease. Does this person have the same rights and protections as a renter? Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe not. So uh, it, it's odd sometimes the things you find in the law. Uh, in landlord-tenant law, there's actually a definition section in Minnesota, uh, which isn't true in every state, by the way. Uh, Minnesota has a definition section for landlord-tenant law. And so landlords and tenants are actually defined by law like it was a dictionary or something. Uh, and uh, the key question would probably be, um, to some degree. Uh, I'm not going to answer the probate aspect of this. I know uh, virtually nothing about probate law. I took wills and estates in, in law school, but that was a bit ago, and uh, I couldn't answer most questions about it. But from the landlord-tenant perspective, the question that I would be asking, if the son were to call us up, for instance, and say, hey, uh, the estate is trying to kick me out, the first thing we try to determine is, is the son a tenant? Does the son have the rights of a tenant? Now, because he's a family member, doesn't mean that somehow he's not a tenant, which is something that we will see occasionally where uh, somebody will say, hey, I'm, I'm their mom, so I can kick them out. This is my home. I get to do with it what I want. Maybe, maybe they do. Uh, but from a landlord-tenant perspective, the key question is, does the son owe rent of some type in exchange for staying there? So it's easy if there's a written lease and there's a dollar amount that the son has to pay each month. That's an easy question. If it's not a written lease, though, and it frequently is not in these types of situations, the next question is, okay, did he pay anything to stay there? Did he cover the utilities? Did he, did he have any specific tasks, jobs, chores uh, that were ongoing? Um, if his job was to watch over a sick relative for months or years, and in exchange he got to stay there for free, then yeah, probably has the rights of a tenant. And if there was no specific amount of rent necessarily due, uh, in theory, under state law, then he would get a three-month notice to vacate first before an eviction could be filed for holding over. So it can be a little bit complicated. Um, and I, I will give you the site on that one so you can look at it because it's sort of an incredulous answer that uh, I've, I've talked to landlords in the past and they're like, what, three months? Where did you get that from? I didn't make it up. Uh, it was made up uh, during a long time ago when people were concerned about harvesting crops and they figured that if you'd planted crops, three months would give you enough time to uh, in theory, get those crops. A lot of tenants happen to be uh, farmers back then. So anyhow, the stat, uh, statutory site on that is Minnesota Statute 504B, as in boy, 0.135, which I'm sure Eric will put up in just a minute. Again, 0.135 is that one, Eric. It's not fair for me to ask him to put something on the screen just as he's about to ask the next, qu next question, but there we go. 
Five hundred four B one thirty five. One thirty five. Yes. Thanks. Okay. I will put that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So another uh, question. Uh, I thought I saw something about pending legislation that made it through a House Minnesota State Rep. State Rep. House vote and added a 30-day pre-notice of eviction following the end of the moratorium. You know the status of that? Uh, uncertain at this point. Um, yeah, I've been doing this long enough and it's not our primary job uh, trying to make legislation happen by any means. Uh, but we certainly are aware of this. We get asked about legislation a lot by people at the city level and at the state level and sometimes even at the federal level because we just do landlord tenant law. There's, there's just only so many people that do nothing but landlord tenant law. And so we're seen as experts and consulted on a lot of these things. But in my experience, when it comes to statutes and ordinances, uh, unless the gavel comes down and somebody, a governor or a mayor signs off on it, it's, it's never done until it's done. So that uh, proposed statute uh, is is a proposed statute as near as I know it's not likely to pass in the Senate but things change I'm not sure if there was some sort of deal uh, behind the scenes between the governor and the Republicans in the Senate uh, in exchange for um, limiting the shelter in place order that the governor did yesterday as well so maybe there's something in the works but as it stands right now that law is uh, not a law it's just a proposal is there a 30 day pre notice under the CARES Act, Federal CARES Act uh, eviction suspension that expires at the end of July? Yeah, we, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll just bring up a little bit more detail on that. The 30 day requirement, um, it can't be given before July 25th, I wanna say is the date. So if a landlord hasn't been getting paid since March, and they realize the CARES Act is coming up and let's say they, the landlord knows that they're covered by the CARES Act, but they're just waiting for the CARES Act to no longer have an impact on their situation. They could be thinking on June 25th, I'll just give the June, I'll, I'll just give the 30 day notice now. And then on July 26th, assuming July 25th is the right day, uh, then I can go file an eviction. Uh, but the CARES Act actually thought about that and said, nope, you, you can't give the 30 day notice until July 25th is passed. So, uh, I think on July 26th, you can give the 30 day notice, meaning August 25th, I think the eviction could be filed because there's 31 days in July. So uh, that is uh, where the, the 30 day notice has the uh, official status in this question about when a landlord can file an eviction, at least as of now. Uh, at the state level, legislation of course could be passed uh, that would require a 30 day notice or a 10 day notice or a 20 day notice or a 100 day notice, whatever they'd like to do. Um, but right now it doesn't exist uh, as a statute, just a theory. Uh, Hennepin, housing, Hennepin County Housing Court has said that eviction actions uh, in the future will require an affidavit of the plaintiff or an attorney test of, attesting to the fact that the property does not have a federally backed mortgage, aka under the CARES Act. They also suggested that the landlord must have some type of proof of that. Do you know what would be expected? Yeah, um, so this is sort of a hot question, um, and I'm happy to hear that Hennepin County is asking for that from the landlord. Again, I think the only party in the world that can probably produce this information is the landlord. I mean, unless you're going to go deep subpoenaing, and for evictions where a tenant has seven to 14 days notice, it's inadequate time to try to mount that sort of defense here. So asking the landlord to A, uh, submit an affidavit, which means it's sworn under oath, or an attorney attesting to uh, the status of the CARES Act criteria. It makes a lot of sense, and we've seen that in other jurisdictions too. Uh, the most notable one that I've still seen is the Michigan Supreme Court issuing really official looking orders instructing the lower courts on how to proceed. I would love to see Minnesota's Supreme Court take a similar step to instruct not just Hennepin County Housing Court uh, in Ramsey County Housing Court, but also every court in the state uh, on how to proceed next. As far as what's gonna be required, I'm, I'm not sure what that would look like. Uh, probably some sort of certification from the mortgage provider, uh, maybe naming who actually is um, behind the mortgage completely. That would be the easiest way that I could see to confirm that. And there's probably some official documentation in each mortgage that would suffice to answer that question. 
I am certain that mortgage providers, especially of duplexes, are going to realize this question is going to be asked a lot and will probably come up with some sort of um, industry standard um, type of evidence that would be sufficient for a court really quickly. Um, and again, as I mentioned, I would love to see the state Supreme Court issue something official on this. Uh, I, I mentioned this yesterday when I was talking to social workers and tenants. Uh, although we're concerned as tenant attorneys and advocates uh, about how things will work in Hennepin County and Ramsey County where they have housing courts, those aren't the courts that I'm most concerned about when it comes to justice happening uh, in the eviction world in the COVID-19 era. Um, lawyers and judges all rely on precedents. That's what we do. We, we, we base our decisions and our advice uh, on things that have been decided in the past. Um, and, and sometimes there's new issues that come up and you have to find what you can that's similar from past decisions and apply it to the current situations. But this COVID-19 era is a lot of brand new stuff. And uh, in Hennepin County and in Ramsey County, where they deal with so many of these cases, what I'm encouraged about is, and this isn't surprising, they're thinking it through because the volume of cases that they deal with is so massive that they have to think it through. And right now is when they can think it through. They aren't running the eviction uh, factory, if you want to think of it that way. I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen the eviction calendar in housing court in Hennepin or Ramsey County, but there's a lot of people and a lot of cases in a very short amount of time. And so they have to move through them somehow efficiently while still trying to maintain justice, right? I mean, if, if you've got a landlord and a tenant there, it's presumed that both sides should have a chance to state their view on something uh, or else it's just a formality. So they try to have it somehow at least uh, aim for being a, a fair hearing. Um, there's ways that Hennepin and Ramsey County can still try to maintain the best parts of what they do and, and, and keep uh, efficient while still trying to, to have justice in place and obvious and evident for everybody that watches it. Um, and one of the things they can do is they can hear more, more cases on different days. They can just say, instead of three days a week, we're gonna do five days a week. Instead of just the mornings, we're gonna do the mornings and the afternoons. That'll keep fewer people in the, in the courtrooms, uh, hopefully. Um, but the giant numbers of cases that we might get, and they might all happen at once because it's, I, I guess we could pass a rule or something that says that landlords can't file an eviction the first week after the moratorium is lifted unless their last name starts, you know, A through F and just decide that it's going to be a sequential thing. But I, I haven't seen any proposals like that. I think that's the first time I've heard of that theory. So it's probably a bad theory, but uh, there, I mean, we get, 15 to 20,000 evictions every year in Minnesota at over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, there's a chance that we're going to get that many in a week in Minnesota. I think there's a real chance that we're going to get that many in a week when the eviction moratorium is lifted um, or double or triple or 10 times that. We don't really know. It's going to depend on how long the moratorium lasts and how much tenants were able to come up with the rent. Uh, we've been hearing encouraging signs that April's rent wasn't as delinquent as was initially thought because much of the uh, unemployment uh, compensation has been coming through a little bit quicker than people thought it might ever do. The federal stimulus came through. And so uh, as we understand from talking about tenants and landlords, the delinquencies on rent haven't been the avalanche that we had hoped wouldn't happen. And that's good news. Um, but we're also hearing that tenants are using credit cards to pay their rent, which is just delaying when the bill is actually going to come due for them. Um, and as this goes on, I think that the percentage of tenants that aren't current on the rent will simply increase. I think there's going to be a lot of tenants that just move out at some point before the eviction is filed, which means that the eviction isn't necessary. But uh, Hennepin and Ramsey County have two big advantages. They're used to dealing with high volume. So they've, they've sort of figured out how to make that work as effectively as they can. And they tweak it all the time. They're always trying to figure out ways to make it better if they can. I'm also hopeful that they're going to be able to adapt more quickly. If they first week out of the gate and, and things just aren't working at all, they can take a quick step back, look and see what isn't working and try to fix it. But like I said, my primary concern in making sure that the courts are doing this right is everywhere else in the state. Because those courts, while they do hear evictions, 
uh, probably don't hear it anywhere near the volume they're about to see. And they're not used to trying to figure out how to do the, deal with this volume. And these aren't going to be the only cases those courts hear. Housing courts are designed really to hear evictions. And they hear rent escrows, they hear lockouts, but it's really about evictions. That's really what they do uh, because that's just the volume of their cases. Um, throughout the state, though, those courts hear all the cases, right? I mean, you might have a judge that hears a, a criminal case five minutes after the civil case, the eviction. Or they might have a family law dispute happening at the same time. Um, so those judges have to be aware of and deal with all kinds of different rules and laws. And so expecting them to understand the nuances of the CARES Act versus the eviction moratorium, like I said, I'd love it to see, I'd love to see, honestly, as an officer of the court, that's what all attorneys are, um, just to see that we've got consistent approaches taken around the state. Uh, I'd love to see the Supreme Court issue um, really direct uh, almost orders on how these cases should proceed once the eviction moratorium is lifted. And just jumping back to that, we have joined with a number of other uh, legal service organizations to make that request to the Supreme Court. I'm going to put in the chat box an example. Again, this is not what is current law in Minnesota, but um, multiple other states have done this. Michigan was the first one. That's just a link to the press release where it has an example of what they're requiring in their state. And again, this is Michigan Supreme Court interpreting a federal law and how it should apply. Um, I, while there might be some tiny differences how a Minnesota court should, should view this, this is a really good blueprint for any court, uh, I think, throughout the country to use. In fact, if I were you know, a referee in a housing court right now, I'd start with this as my blueprint until Minnesota Supreme Court gives me something more aimed at Minnesota, because you'll find the words Michigan in here, but it's not really about Michigan at all. Next question, Hennepin, uh, Hennepin has provided a good update on future on how future court proceedings will look like. Haven't seen the same out of Ramsey County. Any idea how they plan to operate? It's unclear uh, right now. It, they might be yeah, I, I'm not sure what we're going to see out of Hennepin County, although we've been getting signals, uh, it still all feels very theoretical to me. Um, I, I know that there's a big possibility that we're going to be having cases not in person. Um, they're either going to be a Zoom case like this is, or it's going to be over the phone, um, probably if and only if all the parties consent. Uh, as I'm sure many of you can imagine, there are a large number of tenants that, that wouldn't be able technologically to get to a Zoom meeting. Um, and so the in-person meeting, in-person court case might be the only thing that's really practicable for all the litigants involved. And so uh, are these cases going to be in person is the first big question. I mean, that's a giant deviation from all the other court cases pretty much forever in our court systems. Uh, I know that in conciliation court, it's allowed for the parties to appear by phone but it's completely at the judge's discretion was the old rule. We do a lot of conciliation court cases in our office, uh, people trying to get security deposits back and that's where they go. Uh, and especially if they leave the state, they wanna figure out a way to sue without having to return to Minnesota. Uh, but having evictions not be in person is a brand new world. And so uh, are they gonna be in person? Are they going to be limited who can be in the court room? Um, are all questions, how many people can be in the courtroom? I mean, if, if, uh, if you have 10 cases, but everybody brings an attorney and there's mediators involved, then it's not 20 people in the room, right? Suddenly we're up to 30 or 40 people in the room, plus whoever's there in the court. And so, uh, again, my hunch is that how Hennepin County and Ramsey County housing courts are going to work is they're going to plan everything out and they're going to try it. And then we're going to see changes, uh, maybe subtle, maybe massive. Uh, fairly quickly afterwards because what works they'll keep and what doesn't work they'll say you know what we tried it that didn't work we have to move on to something else so predicting exactly what a Ramsey County or a Hennepin County or any county is going to do precisely right now you could look at what courts are saying or what they're uh, opining but um, to say that with any kind of firmness until we actually see those first couple cases happening uh, it's going to be tricky uh, the one I think nice thing about this and what we're trying to do is figure out a way to, uh, if these are going to be Zoom cases, that they can be observed. Um, and so another landlord that has a court case the next day could, you know, peek in to see what, how is this case working? What do I need to do get, to get prepared? And so can a tenant. 
Uh, these, these should be public cases, just like eviction cases are public as, as it stands right now. Anybody wants to go to an eviction hearing, they can go as a member of the public and watch. Um, and uh, so I'm hoping that, uh, well, it sort of leaves the first couple days of people as the, uh, the, the first experiment with the new system, it should inform everybody else coming after. Uh, all right, that's most of the, that's the ones we got in advance. So I'm gonna shift over. Okay. Um, if if tenants are causing a disturbance, arguing or yelling on a daily basis, what uh, can a landlord do in sh uh, short of calling police? Yeah. So um, we actually looked at this yesterday in our office. As as I mentioned, we take fifteen thousand calls a year. We keep track of why people call us. Um, we actually have a, a list of issues that people call us about. There's about 75 that, that we've kept track of for 25 years, or I'm sorry, 27, 28 years now, uh, that we have uh, been open. And uh, we've, we've seen an uptick in neighbor complaints about neighbors. Um, and so this is something that's happening. And I guess it's not surprising if everybody's home all day, every day, uh, the noises from the neighbors are going to be well, they're going to be heard more, first of all, right? I mean, if you're usually gone eight hours a day for work and then you go, you know, have dinner or you go to the gym or you go to a movie or go to your friend's house. So you're maybe not even at your home for 10 hours or 12 hours a day. Uh, those are 10 or 12 hours a day that you can't hear what the neighbor's doing. Uh, and if that happens with a lot of neighbors, then, you know, the interaction between neighbors is just the normal version is, is lessened. But if everybody's at home, then the neighbor versus neighbor kind of conflicts really get... I'm not sure if they get ramped up, but they just get noticed more. Uh, I think everybody's got a little bit more of a hair trigger temper on some topics right now. And, and there's not a lot in the world that we can control. At least a lot of us feel that way today. But uh, somebody making a lot of noise next door, well, it feels like I should be able to do something about that. So I'm going to complain to my landlord about that noisy neighbor who's constantly making noise all day. Um, I, I have been the person in our office over the years who's dealt with neighbor uh, complaints more than anybody else. Uh, we have several attorneys, uh, I think seven attorneys, a, a few work half time right now. Um, and everybody sort of has one area that they, they get most of the calls on. And neighbors has always been the one that I've gotten a lot of the calls on. Uh, and a lot of times I can say that neighbor disputes can be resolved without evictions, without calling the police, uh, when the lines of communication get opened up somehow. But it really requires the landlord being involved. Um, on neighbor disputes more than any other disputes that we or issues that we see uh, with landlords, landlords will almost always start with the default of ah, I can't do much. They might not say that. They might say I'll talk to them or I'll do something about it. But it's a it's a tricky spot for a landlord to be in if you think about it. I've, you've got two customers. One is complaining about the other. You don't really want to favor one customer over another. So. It's easiest and best if it just sort of works itself out. And I think a lot of landlords hope that that's the case. The next step might be they'll, they'll call the tenant who's you know, being complained about or they'll send a text or an email or a note. Um, and it rarely goes past that for the landlord. I mean, if you look at why evictions get filed, for instance, uh, noise, which there's only an eviction for noise against a tenant if neighbors are complaining loudly enough to, you know, convince the landlord that they need to file the eviction. Or sometimes the landlord lives next door, but it's almost always neighbor versus neighbor. And the landlord says, fine, I'll finally go take some action on this. Those are pretty rare, pretty rare evictions. Now, I think there's a fair number of non-renewals that happen where the landlord just waits until the lease is up and then they decide to not renew the lease for somebody who they've had noise complaints about for weeks or years. Um, but uh, yeah, can a landlord call the police right now? Sure. But uh, what I would start with in almost every one of these situations is, is try to pin down from the complaining neighbor, when does the noise happen? What time of day? How can, can you describe it to me? What kind of noise is it? Now, sometimes it's really unavoidable, right? You've got little kids and, they're, and somebody else is living below them and the little kids are jumping off the bed all the time and onto the floor and they think it's amazing. Can anything be done about that? Well, maybe, actually, maybe there is something that can be done. Sometimes landlords will buy a you know, thick throw rug to put right next to the bed so it softens the effect. Little things like that can make a massive difference. And again, from a landlord's perspective who has customers, you've got the, the tenant who's making the noise and the one complaining about the noise, they might think at least you tried something to solve the problem. It might not be a very big cost. Um, sometimes it's things that tenants don't even understand for, <laughs> I mean, 
if, if a neighbor is a video game enthusiast, uh, one of the things that they might do is have the music on for the video game, not even really realizing it because it's just kind of this endless loop of music that they tune out in their mind, but they play it through their speakers hour after hour, sometimes late into the night and early into the morning. And so a pair of headphones can be the solution to it, uh, that they can keep listening to their game. All they do is put on some headphones and then everybody's happy or happier. Uh, so there are ways that landlords can try to solve this without calling the police, without filing an eviction, but it requires some communication effort. Uh, and of course, all the parties have to be willing to, to, to talk. Uh, the next question from Kimberly, what happens if I can't pay utilities on a multifamily building where I pay the utilities as a landlord, uh, count, counting on, on rent to cover those expenses? Also, uh, well, you want to maybe tackle the first one? There's a second question. Sure, uh, and this is a question that we get on a pretty much a weekly basis now from landlords is, um, well, the, uh, I'm gonna answer it a little bit different. Hopefully it'll still answer your question. Uh, we've had landlords asking, hey, look, the utility costs have shot up. The water is, the water bill's much higher. The toilet's getting flushed a lot more because people are home a lot more, right? They're home double the amount of time they were home before. They're waking hours at least. And so even though utilities are included in the lease, shouldn't I be able to demand that the tenant pay more for utilities? If the utilities are included in the lease, I think that's a really almost impossible legal argument for a landlord to make. You can change later. I mean, when your lease is up, you can say, you know what, next year utilities aren't gonna be included if that's you know, allowable, depending on your situation in the city you're in and things like that. Uh, but, or the rent can go up, um, would be the other solution the landlord could use once the lease is over. But again, you can't change that contract in the middle of the lease. Um, and Kimberly's specific question, which is, hey, look, if they don't pay the rent, how can I cover the utilities if I'm counting on the rent to pay for the utilities? I'm not sure I have a great answer for, for that other than applying for all the type of small business, you know, subsidies that are out there. And I know that at both the, um, both the Senate and the House versions of trying to help not just tenants, but uh, homeowners and landlords have some funding in, in place for those things as well. Um, but uh, if a tenant isn't paying rent right now, my, my, my standard advice to a landlord would be to, once again, open the lines of communication and say, hey, just so we're clear, you're right, I can't file an eviction against you, nor, nor do I really want to. I mean, landlords aren't in the eviction business, they're in the rent collection business. Um, but the governor says your rent is due. And so at some point it's gonna come due. Now, maybe you don't have all of it. Maybe you don't have all of your rent and you've been thinking, I'm not gonna pay a, a little bit of it. Um, I just don't think it makes any sense for me to pay a little bit of it because you're gonna evict me anyway. But uh, if you work something out with me, if we, if we get half the rent, uh, we set up a payment plan, I, I can agree to waive the late fees, which is something that there's a group called the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, which is a landlord, uh, advocacy group, and they uh, recommended early in the uh, pandemic that landlords should waive late fees. The CARES Act waives late fees as well. Uh, so if the CARES Act covers your, your property, then you can't get late fees if it's a per non-payment of rent case. So waiving late fees is something that a landlord could say, look, I, I can chip away at what you owe, but I need you to start getting as current as you can. And let's set up a payment plan. And I, if you can't pay me all thousand dollars a month each rent, fine. Uh, let's do 500 and let's set up an agreement where we, we can get this caught up later because at the end, whenever the eviction moratorium gets lifted, whether it's next month or the end of August, if we're following the CARES Act, uh, if a landlord goes and files an eviction right then because they finally can against a tenant that hasn't been paying rent the whole time, the landlord doesn't get probably money from that tenant. The tenant's probably just gonna lose possession and that's what a landlord wins in the eviction. They win the keys. They don't win money in the eviction. I mean, sometimes landlords get paid by filing an eviction because the tenant pays up what they owe. It's called redemption and the landlord is generally okay with that. These are just sort of court sanctioned collection efforts. Uh, but if the landlord truly wins the eviction, what they win is possession of the rental unit, not money. And so the landlord would have to go sue in a different court for the money that the tenant owes, which they may never get. I mean, if you're a landlord in this game long enough, you realize your odds of collecting that money aren't on the, the good side. Uh, I think it's very realistic that there's going to be, as the pandemic goes on and jobs aren't there, that there's going to be a, a 
massive increase in bankruptcies filed at some point in the very near future. And I don't know why a tenant wouldn't include past due rent in their bankruptcy filing. Uh, and so if a landlord really wants to get paid for all these months where the pandemic was going on and the tenant hasn't paid at all, the first thing the landlord should be at least contemplating from a you know income standpoint is trying to collect the money from the current tenant. If a payment plan can be worked out when the moratorium is lifted even, where the tenant is paying something and they have hard, firm deadlines uh, and the tenant meets them, great. And maybe they can get caught up instead of paying the base $1,000 per month uh, in rent, they pay $1,400 or $1,600. And then both sides write down what's being agreed to to get the tenant caught up once the tenant has started working again. If that's feasible, if that's possible, the, the landlords almost certainly could be in better shape than if they just rushed down to the courthouse to file the eviction. Now, if the tenant says, I'm not going to pay and never going to pay you, good luck, go file your eviction, you don't have much choice uh, once the moratorium is lifted. But uh, it's something that I'm assuming all business-minded landlords are going to think about. This isn't about, you know, are landlords great people or are they not great people? This is just a business analysis. If they want to get paid the rent from somebody that hasn't paid through the pandemic, the most likely way for them to collect that money, that back rent that's due, is by trying to collect it from the, the current tenant instead of the eviction and then tr trying to chase them later on. It's just a less certain approach. I'm going to just add one thing to the original question, too, is if you haven't already, and I'll put an example in the chat box, um, some, uh, like, for example, the city of Minneapolis is, says they're not going to turn off water service for unpaid bills. Um, so you might try contacting your yield to utility companies to see what, uh, or the, or municipalities, um, to see what they're, what they're doing. The second part of the question was tenants want repairs made, but with, without rent being paid, how, how do landlords pay for the expenses? If they're not safety related, can the landlord postpone the repairs? So, uh, landlords can't file evictions right now. That's the current rule. However, tenants can't file the most common, um, court option that they would file to force a landlord to make repairs either at present, which is the rent escrow. Uh, so a tenant's options to force a landlord to fix something right now, I guess they're sort of limited to simply withholding their rent, which is something that in normal times we never would recommend for a tenant to do. And even now we're not exactly recommending it. We just know that some tenants are pursuing that to try to force a landlord to make repairs that they think need to be made. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, on a real basic level, tenants pay their rent and in exchange, they get a place to live that's in decent condition and the landlord gets the rent. And so if one of those things isn't happening, they're sort of mutually dependent, which is why a tenant is allowed legally to withhold their rent if they choose to. Again, that's a bad move for tenants because they get an eviction filed against them. And most tenants would rather avoid having that on their record. Uh, but... Uh, it, it is something where a landlord right now, the tenant can't file a rent escrow. So there's a limit to what the tenant can do to force the issue. Um, I think it's one of those things where if it's a cosmetic thing, a landlord's got a much better argument to, to not be going in and exposing themselves and the tenant to more people. Um, but uh, we still see landlords making repairs these days. Uh, it's more interaction between them and tenants in general, uh, as far as making sure that it's a time and date that the tenant is okay with, because uh, the landlord is trying to be cognizant. I mean, these are customers that the landlord has, and they're trying to make sure that they've got customers that feel like they're being heard on that key issue. But uh, can a landlord simply refuse to make repairs? Well, there's a limit to what a tenant can do to force it right now is, is the short answer. So, and I know we have a few more questions, so. I'll try to get to those in the last few minutes. Yeah, Heidi asks, uh, she, when I called my mortgage company, they said it was not federally backed, that it was a private investor and that the private investor was Fannie Mae. So maybe they're confused. Uh, I'm guessing it would fall under the CARES Act? As I understand it, yes. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that I am not a federally mortgage backed expert. Um, and maybe I will be in the next month when this all starts to really happen. Because it only really matters if the eviction moratorium is lifted. In Minnesota. As long as that remains in place, then the question about Fannie Mae uh, and Freddie Mac are somewhat moot because um, we always look at the local rule first to see if it has a more impact. Um, but yeah, I think that that would fall under the CARES Act as I understand things. The other, the other reason is that late fees cannot be charged. In Absolutely. That's a good point. Thank you. Next question is, uh, can we give a rent increase now? 
tricky question from a legal standpoint. First of all, the easy answer is you can't give a giant rent increase. Uh, the governor had a price gouging executive order that's still in effect, um, which limits um, price increases on necessities, and it includes housing as one of those necessities. So any rent increase of 20% or more is automatically considered a price gouge. Uh, there's a lower level too, which is if it's you know, way above the market rate or some phrase like that uh, for what it would have cost 30 days before the pandemic was declared, I think. Um, and so rent increases could be a violation of the anti-price gouging uh, uh, rule. Um, the harder question, and this is much harder, is any rent increase allowable right now? Uh, and the reason why it's a harder question is because arguably that is terminating the old tenancy. The old tenancy was this rental unit for $1,000 a month, for instance. And if the landlord changes the rent to 1100, which doesn't go above the price gouging 20% rule, but it has materially changed one of the kind of the core pieces of every lease agreement. The core pieces are who are the parties, what is the address, what is the duration and what is the price? Those are sort of the four core things that you look for in every lease, whether it's a handshake deal or you know, a, a 900 page written lease. Um, that is a material change. So is that a termination of the tenancy? We've started to see some indication from the Attorney General's office. They do view this as a uh, termination of the tenancy right now. So in theory, rent increases are potentially not allowable at all right now under the moratorium on evictions and uh, coupled with the price gouging thing. By the way, the price gouging penalty is different than the uh, no eviction, no terminating the tenancy moratorium penalty. So no, the no eviction penalty and the terminating the tenancy, it's up to, uh, I want to say $1,000 and 90 days imprisonment, I think are the, the big severe penalties. The price gouging one is $10,000 per transaction. So uh, pretty big difference in, in, in price there. Uh, another question about notice periods. If the original lease had two month requirement for notice and the tenant is holding over once the, once the emergency, peacetime emergency order is lifted, does the landlord need to give a two month notice or give a one month notice since they held over? Uh, it depends probably on how the lease is worded. So this sort of backfires on landlords when they have a two month notice requirement on in their lease. Uh, it probably applies to them as well. In fact, it does apply to them as well. Um, a new law was enacted last fall, largely driven by um, students, uh, university students uh, who wanted uh, a few different rules passed. And this one says that if there is different notice periods in the lease, that uh, the tenant more or less gets to pick which one they prefer. Um, so what we would see in the past was the, the landlord would only have to give a 30-day notice uh, of a non-renewal or a notice to vacate or even a rent increase, but the tenant would have to give a 60-day notice to vacate, which leads to all kinds of bizarre theoretical issues because there's no rent cap in Minnesota generally. There is right now, but in general there isn't. Uh, the rent cap is the price gouging limit. Uh, but the old rule, a landlord could go up to a million dollars a month in rent. And if the tenant had to give a 60 day notice, the landlord could give that shorter notice. So the starting point answering that question is look at the lease. What does the lease require? Does it require two months notice? Then yeah, you're going to have to give two months notice landlord. Um, or if the tenant wants to stick around, you can always talk to the tenant and say, Hey, look, we, we want to sign somebody else up. We'd like you to leave in a month. Would you agree to that? And if the tenant agrees to it and, and does so in writing, then you're good. But if they don't, then you're going to have to give the notice required under the lease. If you've been uh, trying to get a hold of the tenant during this time and you can't get a hold of them, you've been door knocking notices, texts, emails, and if you don't see anybody in the unit, can you take, can a landlord take over the unit? Yeah, so, I mean, we get this question during uh, non-COVID-19 times too, uh, sometimes. Uh, and uh, the short answer is it's really uh, case specific. And I, I don't wanna give some sort of blanket answer here, but one of the things that I would recommend is you contact the tenant in every way that you know how, and it looks like you're doing that. But this time you tell them, you know what, we've gotten no response from you. 
we want to make sure that everything is okay. And so on Tuesday, we're going to come in just for the sole purpose of confirming that you're still there and that you haven't abandoned and there's nothing wrong. And if you're going to do that, you, you show up at the door with gloves and a mask and you knock and say who it is. And I would bring a witness and I'd also uh, film the whole thing uh, as you're entering. Uh, and then you, at each threshold, you announce yourself again, right? As, as you're about to enter the bedroom, as you're about to enter the bathroom, same thing. Um, so I don't think there's anything in COVID-19 that says you couldn't confirm that the place hasn't been abandoned. Um, but I, like I said, I would recontact the tenant in every way you can try, uh, including if you have any emergency contact information uh, on your lease, there's, there's no law against contacting them for this purpose. Uh, if there's a co-signer for sure, uh, and, and let them know, look, we're going in to make sure that this is what's going on. And then once you confirm that the place is abandoned, then it's a matter of dealing with, with what's next. We got uh, one in the Q and A and a couple in chat and it's 2.30, you wanna try to tackle all of them? Yep, let's just try to race through them as quickly as we can. All right, um, Kim asked, did, did we say that a uh, tenant can't file rent escrow now in the fourth judicial district committee meeting um, they were starting, they said they were starting to do Zoom hearings of backlog filings from prior to the emergency order. Those include rent escrow actions and commercial evictions. So writs are on hold. Um, you know what? I have not heard that they're doing rent escrows yet. Maybe they are. Uh, I, I know that they sh they're, they're hearable from a Zoom standpoint, certainly, but I have not heard that they're actually running these. And Kim sending the question in is an attorney who's on the bench and bar committee. So she might have information. I, I am not on that committee. We have somebody else in our office that is. Uh, that, uh, but I wasn't in the meeting. So I don't know the rent escrows are actually being heard in Hennepin County. I can say with uh, great uh, certainty that they are not being heard throughout the entire state. If they're being heard in pockets, then that would be a bit surprising to me still. But uh, I can confirm that by the next time we, we have a session next, next Thursday. You might have answered this next one already, but uh, if a landlord's lease requires two month calendar notice to vacate, can we still enforce this? Yeah, it depends a lot on, uh, I assume this is the landlord asking this question. Um, uh, it depends a lot on when they're trying to end the lease. If it's for May, the end of May, then no, that, that, that notice wouldn't work for the landlord. They'd have to give a new notice probably. Um, again, there's other ways to try to approach that, but that's the way that I think most landlords are gonna practically go through it. Uh, and then what if we get paperwork from MHRA? I'm not, I'm not sure if that was what they meant. M maybe MPHA, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. I'm not sure what they're referring to. For, uh, what if we get paperwork for an increase in rent for a renewal of lease in September? So this is a tenant calling or writing in, do we think? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, uh, Madeline, if you, if you want to try that question again, either uh, next Wednesday or Thursday, we'll be happy to try to answer it if you want to give us some more details. We're, we're not familiar with that acronym. Uh, if, if it's right, we're not sure what, what this is referring to. Sorry. And then one that came earlier, do the state and federal eviction suspensions impact ability to negotiate mutual termination such as cash for Q's deal? No, I think a landlord and a tenant can certainly agree to vacate. And, and that's happening plenty. I mean, tenants that have planned to leave at the end of May are still leaving, which, I mean, is sort of a mutual termination, I guess, in one way, uh, because the landlord isn't fighting it. Um, but yeah, I think a landlord and a tenant can agree to stuff. The uh, landlord just can't file the eviction or terminate the tenancy. But I think an agreement between the parties, there's nothing that I've seen in any of the orders that uh, precludes that. I think that does it. I think we got to everything there. So uh, again, thank you everybody for uh, attending today. And uh, again, you'll get a follow-up email with uh, the recording, a link to the recording and registration for uh, next week, again, next Thursday at 1.30. And I appreciate all the questions that people submitted today. Uh, it really uh, helps us focus on what it is you are dealing with right now. And so I appreciate the interactivity. Thanks all, goodbye.